Okay, at this point in time, we'll invite uh, our speakers up to the podium here for our panel discussion. Uh, while the speakers are coming up, I just want to remind you that at 3 o'clock, there will be a breakout session on concussion and imaging in young athletes. Uh, please prepare your questions. Uh, while, while our speakers are uh, coming to the podium, uh, I'm going to ask Vlad a question, since we have a little controversy going here. Let's uh, we throw still this friends? a little bit. <laughs> we'll uh, go with BR Vlad, do you see a time when uh, one of your surgical colleagues is going to operate on a CTA alone? So the, this, uh, this is a very good question, because the technological development has been tremendous in CT, and I think that's where all the, the data trends are, and the, the publication data are, are really paralleling that with that uh, remarkable um, upslope, right? So um, as the dose of radiation becomes less, and uh, the, the sensitivity of the method becomes uh, much better uh, on, on a short time, uh, and uh, lower radiation exposure for the patients, that will be valuable for intermediate, right, low to intermediate risk patients. The challenge is, and I will invite my friend Sonia Barra to comment, still friends, uh, still friends um, is in the high risk where there's a lot of calcium burden, which is one of the limitations of uh, the method. Yeah. So um, I, I would say it's been only 10 years that we know that CT is for real, um, and that may not be enough for our surgeons to change practice. Um, but you see cardiac CT and surgical literature publications yet. Most surgeons will, will insist still on an invasive angiogram um, today, but I think it will probably be changing in the, in the future. Are there studies in, in, right now that are evaluating operating exclusively on the basis of CTA? Uh, that's a great trial to do. To my knowledge, there is no such trial going on. It's not from cardiology. Okay, questions from the audience? On the right there, thank you. Yes, for Dr. Eads, um, you, mentioned, you mentioned at the beginning that mammography had ba basically no risks. Um, but there's been plenty of evidence that we are detecting breast cancer too early and we are overdiagnosing breast cancer. And in some countries, I don't remember right now, in the European Union, um, the mortality benefit of doing so many mammograms is not well established. So can you comment on that? So there's a, a lot of controversy regarding uh, screening mammography, the mortality benefit, are we overdiagnosing breast cancers? And a lot of that has to do with how um, a lot of these screening trials have been done. Um, it's, it's hard to prove that there are breast cancers that wouldn't eventually kill a patient. It's hard to do randomized controlled trials in screening mammography. But we do know that if you uh, account for some of the biases in the, in the statistical analysis, that all the observational studies that have been done have shown a 30% reduction uh, of mortality due to breast cancer because of screening mammography. Um, yes, we might detect some cases of DCIS that might take some time to progress, um, but we know that we are making significant um, improvements to breast cancer mortality. Okay, on the left. Um, just another question for Dr. Eads. Is there any role for the MRI breast imaging in pregnant women above the age of 40 or lactating, or will it have a high false positive rate? Um, so we do not give gadolinium um, to patients who are pregnant, and so we cannot do an MRI with contrast with pregnant patients. Um, so we can't detect cancer without giving them that contrast. Um, I don't really see a role for doing a non-contrast MR. That would be just for implant evaluation. Um, in lactating patients, um, we typically start with ultrasound. We can do a mammogram if needed. They just might have a lot of milk that could obscure the finding on the mammogram. Um, we don't typically do MRIs, um, although it's not necessarily contraindicated in a lactating patient. Um, we typically just have them kind of pump and dump and get rid of the breast milk after the exam. So on a technical level, since I tend to enjoy MRI, um, watch, be on the watch for some non-contrast technology.
techniques. Uh, one of the techniques that we're looking at and others looking at are diffusion weighted imaging. It's not necessarily proven yet, but we're tweaking that. So I think I'd be optimistic. Uh, questions from from other uh, questions from the floor? There's one Twitter. right here. Yes, go ahead. So we have one question on ordering uh, CTAs. Uh, cardiac CTAs for Dr. Abara. Is this something that they need to refer the patient to the cardiologist first to get the order, or can they order directly for a cardiac CTA? Uh, there's absolutely no need to go through a cardiologist. With CAD rats, uh, many patients can be managed after the results. There may be some patients you would, if you're not a cardiologist, you would consider. Um, depending on the finding, um, to send to a cardiologist after uh, the CT. But there's no reimbursement strings attached um, uh, in this sense. Will the radiology report tell them uh, when you think they need to be referred to a uh, cardiologist after you see the results? Uh, no, it will not say that. Um, it will have uh, what we find, um, what it means, and if any other tests are needed, and what the management is by guideline. And I can imagine uh, many a primary care physician being capable to do uh, lifestyle modification and um, the best medical management. Um, perhaps if you have, say, single vessel disease, um, I can see some people um, opting to send the patient to a cardiologist. Or if you have uh, somebody who has three vessel disease, they will eventually have to see a, a surgeon, most likely for cabbage. Um, I've, got, I've got one question that we'll get to this gentleman. Uh, this goes for Carlos, um, and, and I imagine it applies to some of you. There, many of the reports come back, focal bulge, bulge, herniation, focal herniation, asymmetric herniation. How are you interpreting this array of nomenclature, and how do our primary care people interpret such reports? Oh. I think it. I think that kind of speaks to the uh, the downside of actually uh, doing these images because there's there's always going to be a finding. There's always going to be a bul one or more bulges, um, and uh, you know as I explain to patients, most of it is simply background noise. And so unless it there's a correlation to their clinical symptoms, um, it's it's almost um, unneeded information. Um, and it makes it very challenging to ma to manage patients because they they have access to so much of this information. Um, that they come with the you know bulging disc circled and highlighted and, and so on and so forth and the explanation for their pain and having to undo that is is sometimes a, a bit of a challenge. Will I can comment a little bit about that. There there are there are standardized nomenclatures to describe discs in terms of their morphology. Not everybody may use those and I don't know if the surgeons appreciate that or, or if they look at the images themselves, but there are, there are efforts to standardize the nomenclature uh, with regard to specific disc, disc morphology, with regard to protrusions, vocal herniations, et cetera. So since we have an integrated spine center, Carlos, have we standardized our approach at least to the terminology? Um, we have not, and, and um, so much of our, uh, our patients actually come from outside of our network. So it, uh, internally, I think there's a lot of consistency, but there's so much overlap that um, there's, there's a lot of uh, non-standard language. And Unfortunately, I can attest that even from the reporting side of things within our own division in neuroradiology, there may be inconsistencies. Partly of that is just the nature of the findings, that there is some subjectivity to some of these findings, not necessarily for disc, disc disease, but something, for example, like foraminal stenosis. That is a very subjective assessment, and there'll be, there'll, we could try to do better is the is bottom line. Okay, question from the floor, please. Yes, for Dr. Eads, kind of a two-part question. I uh, see this all the time. Uh, asymptomatic patient, uh, no family history of breast cancer, no prior biopsies, but, you know, class C or D, dense breasts. Uh, is it appropriate to just recommend a tomosynthesis the following year or go ahead and recommend supplemental ultrasound? And then the second part is if you get class C or D dense breasts on a tomosynthesis, is that adequate enough? Okay, um, so keep in mind that like 50% of the population
prescription is going to be dense breasts, mm -hmm. and, and most women are not getting supplemental screening ultrasound. We do know that everyone does benefit by doing the tomosynthesis exam, and typically we'll do that you know, at the same time of screening. We won't do it as a later step you know, at a different time that same year. Um, and then the decision regarding um, ultrasound screening really depends on kind of a discussion between the doctor and the patient about their level of risk and their concerns. Um, we do know that we find maybe two to four more cancers per thousand women if we do ultrasound, but we're going to do a lot of unnecessary biopsies, so it's kind of up to the comfort level of the patient. If she wants to have it done, we're happy to do it. So More one questions. last question, and this one is for Dr. Leston. Uh, so in the city of Dallas, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, can we really feel comfortable with those patients having sinus disease coming and not doing CT imaging? I am comfortable not doing CT imaging for headache. I don't treat sinus disease. Some of these people will uh, be treated for the sinus disease by their primary care doctor or by uh, ENT, and they, um, uh, they may or may not need imaging for that reason, to look at the sinuses. If, um, uh, if we're confident that the, um, that the origin of the headache is sinus disease, um, it's such a low likelihood that we're going to find anything in the brain that I would not image for that reason. Dr. Moore, can you speak to that as well? Sure. Um, so my understanding uh, in my experience is that the imaging findings on sinus CT do not correlate very well to the clinical symptomatology. We frequently will find evidence of uh, mucosal disease on asymptomatic patients. So I think the diagnosis of sinusitis is, is traditionally a clinical one and can be treated clinically without imaging. Um, but if that is recalcitrant to, to, to imaging, I mean, sorry, to treatment, then imaging may be indicated. Okay, I don't see any more questions. Is it, oh, question right there, go ahead. Um, do we have the microphone? Where's the question? Right, right here in front, this gentleman right here. Dr. Bear, I was curious what your opinion is on um, coronary calcium scores in asymptomatic patients. So coronary calcium scores versus coronary CT angiography. Um, it's a simple divide. Calcium scores are for only or essentially for non-symptomatic patients for risk assessment. So if you're like, eh, he's on the edge with Lipitor and it's expensive, um, you do a calcium score, it will help you reclassify a patient that's intermediate into high risk or low risk, or they may stay intermediate and you know, then you're stuck. Um, so we don't use calcium scoring on symptomatic patients. Having said that, if you do a CTA, you often get a calcium score for free. So if it is negative, if it wasn't obstructive disease, then uh, you have the number to help you uh, manage the patient and go look for whatever the cause of the symptoms were. Okay, I think given that we're a little bit over time, I want to give you guys a chance for a break. Thanks a lot to the speakers for a wonderful session. Thanks to you for your great questions. Mm -hmm. Also, our panelists will be available in the consult room. If we can have all of our panelists go to the consult room for additional questions if you have them.